What's up, y'all? Alvin here, and today is the day. <laughs> We're going to start talking about redfish on the fly. So I get asked, not every time I'm out with clients, but pretty often I get asked, what's your favorite fish to fish for? And I've been fortunate enough to, you know, travel around a little bit, fish for a lot of different fish, and... Um, Sometimes it surprises people, but my favorite two fish, because I really can't narrow it down to one, but my favorite two fish are the fish that I get to fish for most often. That's bass and redfish, both Texas native fish that I get to fish for uh, year round. And that may be part of the reason why they're my favorites, because they're the ones that I know the best. They're the ones that I get to spend the most time chasing. Um, I could flip a coin and either one would be great, a great day of bass fishing or a great day of red fishing, and I would be happy. So I thought I would share some of my knowledge that I've gained over all these years of fly fishing for redfish. I did a series of three videos a while back about fly fishing for bass. I'll link that up there if you'd like to check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, so if you're interested in fly fishing for redfish, going to do three videos on this topic as well. Today will be sort of an intro, then we'll go into tackle, uh, you know, flies, rod, reels, line, leaders, all that type of stuff. And then in the final video, we'll do stuff on more specific tactics that will help you catch redfish on the fly. So if you haven't go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Maybe put that little bell notification thing on so you'll know when I put up the next video and let's get into it. So just like uh, the fly fishing for bass videos, people say, you know, well, what's the deal? Why you want to fly fish for redfish? And first and foremost, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, that's what this whole thing's all about, right? Having a good time. Fly fishing for redfish is really awesome. Uh, they're a great intro to saltwater fly fishing. If you live in the United States, anywhere near a coast, you've probably got some redfish, mostly the Gulf Coast and some of the Atlantic Coast. But I'm in Texas and we've got hundreds of miles of shoreline that we can go out and fish shallow water for redfish on the fly. So some of the cool things about red fishing, um, one is it's kind of a combination of hunting and fishing. So we typically are sight casting for the fish. So we don't even cast until we see a fish. So that's kind of cool because, you know, you have to figure out where these fish are going to be, you know, different times of day, different times of the year, different water conditions. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot that goes into actually finding them. And some days that's the hardest part is finding the redfish. So if you like hunting, if you like figuring out complex situations, then fly fishing for redfish is definitely going to be fun for you. Another thing about it is, you know, sight casting. It's a lot of visual stimulation. So we're actually looking for the fish. So you're trying to figure out what does a redfish look like in the water versus a mullet. <laughs> Lots of cast of mullet until you figure out the difference between what a redfish looks like in the water and what a mullet looks like in the water. We'll talk about that in some later videos. Okay, so sight casting for redfish is a great way to learn saltwater fishing. So before you take that fancy trip to the Bahamas or the Seychelles or wherever you're going to go, anywhere that you're going to be sight casting to a fish in shallow water, it's going to be really similar to sight casting for redfish. So it's a good, good, it's a great way to learn how to fish shallow water and sight cast a fish. 
and more than likely, you've probably got some redfish somewhere, you know, if not a drive, uh, a short flight, you can get onto a redfish flat and figure this game out, this sight casting in shallow water game. Now, another thing about redfish, they're great for learning this saltwater sight casting game, but they're actually, I think, one of the harder fish to catch in shallow water. And partly because they don't have great eyesight, like say a bonefish does, you know, or a GT, they're not nearly as aggressive a lot of times. So you really gotta get pretty good at making accurate casts, figure out fish behavior, and really it, it kind of fine tunes your skills so that, you know, by the time you do get to go and do some exotic trip to catch bonefish or catch permit or catch GTs or whatever, sight casting for redfish is going to make you much better at that type of fishing as well. All right, so we're going to talk about rods, we're going to talk about reels, we're going to talk about lines, we're going to talk a little bit about flies, a lot of stuff to talk about flies, <laughs> leaders and tippet. And a couple of things you might not have thought about. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so first up, I gotta say that this is the recommended equipment for the type of red fishing that I'm doing most of the time. So this is gonna vary from place to place, but if you're fishing anywhere in the kind of middle Texas coast, or anywhere else where you're sight casting to redfish in shallow water, shallow water being say two feet deep or less, this is gonna be a pretty good starting point. Things are gonna vary, so don't roast me <laughs> in the comments. If you've got suggestions or ideas, anything to add to the conversation, feel free, please drop those in the comments. All right, so let's get started. For rods, typically I'm going to recommend a seven, an eight, or a nine weight rod. Um, fast action. Now, depending on where you are, you know, like I said, if you're in Louisiana and you're chasing bull reds, your go to might be a nine or a 10 weight rod. But for most of the stuff we're doing, seven, eight, and nine weight rods are sort of the go to. I prefer an eight weight. That would be my go-to redfish rod. Uh, my wife, she prefers a nine weight. Uh, as far as rod length goes, most of those rods are gonna come in at nine feet. Uh, if you can find an eight and a half foot or one of the seven foot 11 um, bass type rods, those will work great for redfish. The shorter rods are gonna be really good, especially for those short, you know, 10 to 15 foot cast, 20 foot cast, those rods are gonna work great. Now, I would probably not pick the shorter, you know, the seven foot 11 rod for my main rod because I don't think they're quite as good for making some of the longer accurate casts you have to make from time to time. But, you know, they're gonna work great for the short cast. If you got one and you're wanting to get into red fishing, go for it, just use that rod. Okay, now when it comes to lines, there are so many different lines. I'm gonna say there's probably more options when it comes to lines than there are for rods. So if you got your floating lines, you got your sinking lines, you got your sink tip lines, you got your weight forward lines, you got your redfish tapers, you got your bonefish tapers. There's so many choices out there. You've got a tropic line, you've got a mono core line, you've got a cold water salt water line. <laughs> the choices are endless and it's really kind of tough to make that final decision. I'm gonna just go ahead and put this out there. Just go with the one you've got and as you learn more about this, then you may be able to fine tune what you need. Now the optimum would be to go to your local fly shop and cast your rod with all these different lines because that's the only way you're really gonna know which one works the best. Or if you're fishing with a guide, tell them like, hey, do you have this particular line? I would like to fish with this line. Um, you know, trial and error is really the only way to decide which fly line is gonna work best for you. 
I would recommend some type of weight forward floating line in a bonefish, redfish, or even a bass taper. Now the bass tapers tend to be a little bit heavier forward, so those are gonna be great for throwing bigger flies, but also for making those quick shot casts. Um, but maybe not the best all around redfish line. Like I said, if you have to make some longer casts, the shorter rods and those short bass heads may not be the best thing for making the longer casts, but a lot of the casts that we make are you know, 20 feet and under. So you should be okay with that. <laughs> Notice I'm covering a lot of bases here and uh, trying to make this as simple as possible for you, but it can get pretty technical if you want it to. All right, so uh, when it comes to backing, not a whole lot to think about. Most of your eight, nine weight reels are gonna come loaded with plenty of 20 to 30 pound backing, definitely enough for red fishing. If you've got 100, 150 yards, you're gonna be good for most of the red fish you're gonna hook. Now, like I've said in the past though, we're using these rigs for more than just red fishing. So if you're gonna be doing some bone fishing, you wanna make sure you got you know 150, maybe even 200 yards of backing. If your reel will hold it, you might as well put it on there. Okay, so. You might have noticed I skipped from rods to lines because really your rod and your line are probably the two most important parts of your gear when it comes to delivering the fly to a redfish or any other fish for that matter. But we do focus a lot of time on reels when it comes to saltwater fishing. And you know, there's, there is good reason for that. Um, you know, you want to make sure that reel is not going to rust after exposure from salt water. Um, you definitely want to rinse them at the end of the day. I know some people who religiously do not rinse their reels at the end of the day and they're like, it's made for salt water. If it can't stand up, then I shouldn't have it. <laughs> but you know, probably best to rinse them off at the end of the day. Uh, the other thing is you don't need a super heavy duty drag for redfish, but and I've caught redfish on some rinky dinky reels back in the day, cause that's all I could afford. But like I said, if you're gonna be using this rig for more than just redfishing, you might as well go ahead and get a good quality reel, something that's got a good drag on it, something that's not gonna rust out after a couple of days in the salt. And more than likely, most of these reels are gonna last you a lifetime. So brands, Pick your favorite brand. I use certain brands, but that doesn't mean that those are the best. Uh, they just mean that that's what was available to me or that caught my eye or I got it for free. <laughs> Let's be honest here. <laughs> now, I got uh, a handful of questions in the comments on the last video about leaders. And just like the rest of this stuff, I really like to keep it simple when it comes to leaders. A lot of times I'll use just pre-tapered leaders, you know, leaders out of the bag that I bought from a fly shop somewhere or I ordered online. Um, occasionally I will sit down and tie leaders, but typically if I'm tying a leader, it's cause I'm somewhere and I don't have a pre-tapered leader to put on my line. Uh, I always have tippet, always have spools of tippet, so I can make a leader if I have to, but it's usually not my go-to. Uh, the pre-tapered leaders are fine in most circumstances. Maybe 12 pound would be my go-to. Um, you know, if the fish are spooky, I may go as low as 10 pound, but I'm a lot more likely to be using 20 pound than I am 10 pound. So, but I usually carry that 10, 12, 15 and maybe 20 pound tippet and leaders. And that's gonna cover most of my bases. All right, so I said we would talk a little bit about flies and I may have to make a whole nother video specifically on redfish flies, but I'll give you the basics right here. So think about red, redfish eat. So it's gonna be a crab, a shrimp, or some type of bait fish. So you're gonna to wanna to be able to imitate those three creatures with your fly selection. Another thing to think about is depth. So we're talking about fish in shallow water, but there's a huge difference between six inches of water and two feet of water. So you wanna have flies that will sink fairly quickly, flies that will sink slowly, and unweighted flies. So 
that will cover most of your bases. So we got six categories, shrimp, crabs, bait fish, weighted, slightly weighted, and unweighted flies. Pretty much everything that I'm throwing, everything that's in my box is gonna fall in one of those six categories, usually in two of those six categories. So an unweighted shrimp pattern, a heavily weighted crab pattern, or lightly weighted streamer pattern, which is gonna imitate some type of bait fish. Like I said, we can really dive deep into these flies. Feel free to ask questions, make comments. I'll probably end up doing a whole video just on redfish flies. Okay, so at the beginning, I said I'm gonna throw out a couple things that you might not have thought about. Um, one of these, you know, is super obvious. The other, not so much. Um, the one that's not so obvious is clothing. And I, I do consider the clothing that you wear on the boat or if you're out waiting an essential part of your equipment. Most of the places you're throwing after redfish are gonna be warm and sunny. So you wanna wear clothing that's gonna offer you good sun protection, um, long sleeve shirts, gloves, uh, <laughs> you know, hats, uh, neck gaiters, the whole nine. I typically wear long sleeves and pants on some of the hottest days of the year. <laughs> when it's not so hot, I'll put my shorts on. <laughs> but you really gotta be careful out there, protect yourself from the sun, because there's nothing worse than getting sunburned. Worst case scenario, getting heat stroke, and that's really gonna cut into your fishing time, that's really gonna cut into your enjoyment of the day on the water. So proper clothing, sun protection, is an essential part of your equipment. Now, what is that other mystery piece of gear that I said I was gonna tell you about from the beginning? Well, it's sunglasses, polarized sunglasses. Not having a good pair or a pair of polarized sunglasses may be the biggest disadvantage for catching redfish on the fly if you're sight casting to them. If you can't see them, you don't know where to cast. And believe it or not, I've been on a trip before and been trying to see fish and then realized like, oh, I can't see anything because I got the wrong color glasses on. Most of the time you're gonna want something in the brown to copper tones, maybe even yellow on a really overcast day, but you're probably not gonna want your dark gray glasses that you use for offshore fishing or even lake fishing. So a good pair of polarized glasses will make a huge difference when it comes to seeing fish on the flats. Uh, I always carry an extra pair in the boat with me in case one of my clients shows up with the wrong tent and they can't see the fish. I hand them the ones with the right tent and they're like, oh my God, this is a night and day difference. <laughs> so yes, make sure you got you a good pair of polarized glasses in the proper tent. All right, before we get in too deep, I just gotta say, these are techniques that have worked for me in the Texas coast redfish fishery. May be a little bit different where you're from. <laughs> you may be in Texas and it may be completely different for you. So if you've got any helpful hints, ideas, suggestions, please throw those in the comments. I'll address them. Hopefully some of the other viewers will address them and we can have like a open discussion on this because these are just my opinions. This ain't the law, this ain't the final word. So please feel free to chime in. All right, so first technique you gotta figure out is how to find redfish. Now, typically for me, I'm looking for fish in shallow water most likely near some way they can escape the shallow water or some type of inlet or outlet that's gonna be bringing in moving water, pushing in bait, pushing out bait. But typically I'm fishing in areas that I'm familiar with. So finding fish, I'm gonna say the best way to find fish is just get out on the water, spend as much time as you can looking for fish and then you'll probably start to figure out some patterns or build up a repertoire of spots you can hit. There's no fish here, I'll go over here, try this spot, 
maybe I'll go hit this next spot. Now, there's a couple different philosophies on finding fish and depending on the day, I may go with either one of these philosophies. One is to keep moving, the other is to keep looking. So obviously, if you are wade fishing or you're fishing from a kayak, you can't cover a lot of water, you probably want to just keep looking. <laughs> uh, and I've had it go both ways. I've stayed in one spot and just kept looking for fish and then eventually we start seeing fish, we start catching fish. Uh, I've run around all day, no fish, no fish, no fish. All of a sudden, oh, there's a bunch of fish. We start catching fish. It really kind of depends on your style. For me, like I say, it depends on day to day. Sometimes you just get a feeling, okay, I know it's gonna happen here. I just gotta put my time in. I just gotta keep looking. And then you end up finding fish. So it's a really hard call to make sometimes. If you've been looking around for half a day <laughs> and you're not seeing any fish, might be a good idea to look somewhere else. But I've looked around for half a day, not seen any fish, and all of a sudden there's fish everywhere. So it could work out for you either way. Okay, so let's get a little bit more uh, nitty gritty, shall we say, casting. Now I've talked about casting in some previous videos. I'll, I'll put a link up here. Casting is maybe the most important skill to have behind finding fish. <laughs> Once you find them, you gotta put the flies in front of them. And there's a few things about fly fishing for redfish that make the casting very challenging. One is you gotta be able to make a quick cast. So these fish are moving, they're going from one place to the next. If you can't get the fly in front of them before they get out of range, you know, if you're wading or you're using a boat, the fish are gonna get spooked eventually. The boat's gonna get too close. Uh, you're gonna make a splash while you're wading, whatever. So you need to be able to make a cast pretty quickly. So not a lot of false casting. You need to be able to, with maybe one false cast, so I'll say four strokes, you need to be able to make your maximum accurate cast that you can make. Now, fortunately, most of the time, we're gonna be getting these fish within 40 feet, so 30 to 40 feet, and on some days, <laughs> you're really trying to figure out how to make that super accurate 15-foot cast. So, speed and accuracy are very important. Speed being number one. You gotta get that fly out there, get it in front of the fish before something happens. The fish gets too far away or the fish gets spooked. Now, when it comes to accuracy, I'm talking extreme accuracy. So the difference between making a cast that lands two feet from the fish and a cast that lands six inches from the fish can make all the difference between catching them or not catching them. One of the reasons why I think redfish are one of the hardest fish to catch on a fly, harder to catch than a bonefish, is because they don't have the greatest eyesight. So I've seen lots of good, look like accurate casts, land two feet from a redfish, the fly starts moving, the fish keeps moving, the fish never even knows the fly was there. <laughs> so when I'm telling my clients, you wanna get that fly close enough to get a reaction from the fish. Either he eats it or he spooks or you know he goes around the fly, but at least you know the fish saw the fly. If the fish just keeps on on his previous course and never deviates, probably never saw the fly. So what you need to do is intersect that fish with the fly. So that fly needs to swim across in front of the fish from left to right or right to left as close as possible. I'm saying within a matter of inches. So that way you know the fish has seen the fly and more often than not, the fish will eat the fly. Now, they can get really weird, and some days you can land a fly two feet away, the fish hears a splash, charges over and eats it. Other days, that fly can land right next to the fish, not spook them, swim across right in front of them, and they can still not eat it. Other things that will happen is the angle sometimes of the fly. So you make a good cast, but it's a weird angle and you start to move the fly and the fly goes across in front of the fish like so, or like so. I call that the kamikaze shrimp attack. 
the fish typically don't like to see the fly coming at them. Same thing with crossing from behind them and passing them up. They usually don't like that either. <laughs> you know, they're like, why is this shrimp, this crab, this bait fish attacking me, coming at me, chasing me down, coming up from behind me? So typically you wanna to try to get that fly to move across in front of that fish from left to right or right to left. The, the tricky casts are when the fish are going away from you, where do you put the fly? Put the fly in front of the fish and hope for the best. The fish is coming right at you, put the fly in front of the fish, and if you can, line it up, wait for the fish to move forward, and try to pull the fly away from them. That works, but it's also a tricky shot. Accuracy, though, is the key to catching redfish on the fly. Okay, so let's get a little bit deeper into the casting thing. Now, an overhead cast typically is gonna be your most accurate cast because you're tracking the fly along the same path that you're looking at the fish. But usually, that fly is gonna land with more of a splash than if you made a sidearm cast, straighten the cast out slightly above the water and then let the fly drop. Now, we're not talking about a you know, dry fly trout presentation, but typically you're gonna want that fly to land a little bit softer than you would if you're throwing a bass bug. You know, a lot of times you can throw a popper down, the bass actually hears the splash and comes over and nails it. Redfish will do that on occasion as well, but typically you wanna make a more delicate presentation. A sidearm cast helps with that. Drop the fly down and then get it moving. Now, speaking of getting it moving, Typically, I like a faster retrieve. Uh, I've seen people catch redfish on slow retrieves or even strip, strip and pause and the fly eats it. But I've seen the fly refused way more often when the fly's not moving fast enough or when you pause the fly in front of the fish. Uh, I think it's sort of like the thing where they tell you not to run from the bear. The bear may not want to chase you down and kill you, but when you start running, that kind of triggers that predatory instinct and then they just can't help it. They gotta just chase you down and kill you. I feel like it's the same way with the redfish a lot of the times. Once again, there's no hard and fast rules, but if I was gonna say move the fly fast or move the fly slow, I'm gonna say move the fly fast. <laughs> All right, so we did talk about flies in the gear section, but I wanna talk a little bit more about flies in the technique section because there is a little bit of technique that's gonna differ from fly to fly. And now one thing is if you've got a area that you're fishing and there's tons of weeds, typically you're gonna want a lighter fly and you're gonna to have to make an even more accurate cast because you're gonna to have to get that fly in front of the redfish and get it moving before you snag a bunch of grass. Now, weed guards will help, but typically the type of floating grass that we see on the redfish flats, at least here in Texas, the weed guards really don't help a lot. This floating grass, it's light, and it just wraps around the reed guard, and you drag the fly in front of the redfish with the weeds on them, and you spook them. So once again, accuracy in your casting, super important. <laughs> All right, so now you put the fly in front of the fish, you get the fly moving, the fish charges over and eats a fly. What do you do next? Well, jerk back on the rod, right? <laughs> Please don't do that. Uh, the, whole, the old trout set thing. Uh, I've seen so many redfish lost because of a trout set. Just like your bass fishing, you want to keep that rod tip down, keep the line tight, and give it a strip strike. A lot of times, even if you just keep the rod tip down and keep the line tight, the fish will hook themselves because they'll usually take off once they eat that fly. But keep that tip down, strip strike, and then let them go. <laughs> so a lot of people have had that strip strike, keep the rod tip down, drilled in their head so many times that that fish grabs the fly, they keep the tip down, they do that strip strike and they hold it. And that fish breaks off. It's usually not that much of an issue with the smaller redfish, but I've seen even some, you know, 18, 19 inch redfish break 20 pound test just because of the shock of them taking off. Definitely with bigger fish, you want to let them run. Even with the smaller fish, you want to let them run. Once you're pretty sure you've got them stuck, just let them go. 
let the drag do its job, and fight them like you would any other big fish. Just don't raise the rod tip. Oh yeah. Oh! Uh oh. <laughs> do we have to say it? All right, so like I said at the beginning, I'm gonna tell you the most important technique to catching redfish on the fly. And that is, you gotta have some patience. Okay, so what do I mean by patience? Basically, just time. You may spend a lot of time on the front of the boat, wading on a flat, pulling your canoe or your kayak across a flat, looking for fish. Uh, some days you don't find them. Some days you see them right off the bat, but more often than not, you're gonna have to put in some time to find the fish. All right, so you found the fish, you gotta be able to make that cast. You need to put in some time practicing your cast, making those accurate casts, dropping that rod tip, stripping that line. It just takes time to get this skill down. Patience, patience, patience. <laughs> All right, y'all. Hopefully that helps some of y'all out, out there. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, please put them down there. Hopefully they'll help somebody out. I read these comments and I have definitely learned some stuff in the comments. So they are wanted, they are needed, and they are super helpful. If you haven't, please subscribe to the channel. That helps me out. Thanks for watching the video. Check out some of my other videos. I'll see you in the next one. And in the meantime, good luck on the water.